It's 1996, Atlanta Olympics. Away, Johnson got a great start. Already up on guards here, Fredrickson Bolden out. Oh my God. With that world record race, Michael Johnson became the only man in history to win both, the 400 and 200 meter in the same Olympics. Each time wearing a pair of gold-colored spikes specifically made for him by Nike. Pictures of Johnson running the race with his legendary golden shoes went around the world. Johnson was the fastest man on earth. Not only did millions of TV viewers see those Nike shoes on their screens, Millions also saw those same shoes slung around Johnson's neck a few days later on the cover of Time magazine. It's hard to imagine better marketing for any Olympic sponsor. Only problem, Nike was not an Olympic sponsor. Reebok was. But when people were asked who was an official Olympic partner, more people picked Nike than Reebok. Reebok had paid millions of dollars to be the official Olympic partner. But consumers only remembered their competitor. Sounds like a bad deal. So Reebok ended the sponsorship with the Olympics. And the Olympics started to take actions against Nike and other companies that were using the games for marketing without paying for it. Fast forward to today and you are not even allowed to tweet about the Olympics without being sued. Even baking a cake with the Olympic rings might get you into trouble. Why did it get so ridiculous? It all goes back to that legendary race in Atlanta. Welcome to Athletic Interest. This is the story of how Nike hijacked the Olympics. Hijacking is a strong word. It also raises the question of who actually owns the Olympics. The easy answer, the International Olympic Committee. Founded by Pierre de Coubertin in 1894, it is the authority that organizes the modern summer and winter Olympic Games. Coubertin's idea was that athletic competition would promote understanding across cultures and thereby lessen the dangers of war. He also emphasized the importance of the competition itself rather than winning. The important thing in life is not the triumph, but the struggle. The essential thing is not to have conquered, but to have fought well. This laid the groundwork of the modern Olympic movement, which is led and managed by the IOC today. Although criticized in recent years, the Olympic movement is an unprecedented success story. The Summer Olympics have grown from a couple of hundred participants representing 14 nations in 1896 to more than 11,000 competitors representing more than 200 nations from around the world in 2016. Money was no issue in the beginning. During the first half of the 20th century, the Games ran on a small budget. Attempts to link the Olympics with commercial interests were actually rejected. The IOC believed the lobby of corporate interests would unduly impact its decision-making. But in the 70s, the Olympics struggled financially. The Montreal Games actually made a loss of almost 1 billion US dollars. So the IOC and its new president, Juan Antonio Samaranch, started looking for new revenue streams to become financially independent. His solution would change the sporting world forever. He introduced exclusivity for sponsorship rights. The Games have had some form of sponsorship from their very beginnings, but for many years anyone who wanted to become a sponsor could arrange some sort of deal. In theory, it was possible for both Coke and Pepsi to sponsor the same Olympics. Samaranch and the team for the 1984 Games in LA changed that. They started selling official global sponsorship and broadcasting rights that had the defining characteristic of being exclusive. Unofficial marketers, who were either not willing or able to pay the money to become an official Olympic partner, were kept out. The move significantly limited the supply of marketing opportunities around the Olympics, and prices for the packages skyrocketed. That revolution had two consequences. First, the IOC made way more money than before. The LA Games made a profit of over 200 million US dollars. Its organizer even made it on the cover of Time magazine. And secondly, companies that were no longer official sponsors had to get creative if they still want to be seen at the Olympics. It was the birth of ambush marketing. The IOC describes ambush marketing as a planned attempt by a third party to associate itself, directly or indirectly, with the Olympic Games to gain the recognition and benefits associated with being an Olympic partner. 
To go back to our Michael Johnson example from Atlanta. Instead of investing millions of dollars to become an official Olympic partner, Nike rather invested somewhere else. In the lead-up to the Games, Nike purchased all available billboards and advertising spaces around the Olympic venues. That way, the swoosh was picked up by TV broadcasts and beamed into the households of billions worldwide. Of course, they leveraged their top athletes like Michael Johnson or Carl Lewis in an almost aggressive commercial. And Nike even handed out flags to fans, guaranteeing that the swoosh logo would be in full view all over the Olympic venues. But the biggest marketing stunt was building a so-called Nike Center in a three-story parking garage just outside the Olympic Park. The prime location, including a retail outlet, became a huge visitor attraction. It featured a basketball court, video theater and hospitality area for Nike's sponsored athletes. Nike's ambush marketing in Atlanta was responsible for the IOC taking a hard line on unofficial brands getting anywhere close to the Olympics. To understand what happened next, we first have to go back to the question of who owns the Olympics. When we say the IOC, that's not entirely true. Nobody can own an event. But what you can own is the right to a name or symbol. Those are protected by intellectual property laws. One example would be trademarks, so the logos that companies use to build their brands. The Olympic properties that the IOC owns are the Olympic rings, flag, motto, emblems, anthem, flame and torch, as well as the name. The IOC requires all member countries to take appropriate steps to protect these properties by law. But that's not everything. As a consequence of Nike's ambush marketing in Atlanta, Every country that wants to host the Games must now create special laws to protect the event from ambush marketing. One of the first laws of that kind was created in the UK for the London Olympics to prevent people from using innovative ways of making an association with the Games. Yes, you heard right. They created laws against, or let's say because of Nike's marketing. These special event laws offer very broad protection to the organizers sometimes to a ridiculous extent, asked the butcher from Weymouth, who was given official warnings for putting up depictions of five interlinked sausage rings in the lead up to London 2012. Why are you doing this to me? I didn't do this to you. You did this to you. You set me up. No, I taught you a lesson. You were not even allowed to combine 2012 and London in one text. So, how did Nike react to these new challenges? On the eve of the London Olympics, Nike launched a video campaign called Find Your Greatness. With this ad, Nike really tested the limits of the laws on ambush marketing. The clip depicted everyday athletes competing in places from around the world named London. Except London in the UK, which they could not show due to legal reasons. But the message was clear enough to everyone athletes performing in London in an ad by Nike. A spokesperson for Adidas, the official sponsor, attempted to downplay Nike's campaign. We have absolutely no issue with it at all, there is no sign of ambush marketing, I don't think Nike's ad relates to the Olympics at all. The Adidas spokesperson was probably less relaxed when he realized that the Nike clip went viral and became the most watched ad during the Olympics, easily beating the Adidas campaign. In a study after the Olympics, 37% identified Nike as the official Olympic sponsor and only 24% voted for Adidas. Despite specific laws against them, Nike just did it again. They hijacked the public attention around the Olympics that its official partners paid for. It is a common argument that Nike and other ambush marketers hurt the official sponsors and in the long term the Olympic movement itself that relies on sponsorship money. The IOC, as guardian of the Games and leader of the Olympic movement, has to protect the Olympics against ambush marketing. But on the flip side, credit also needs to be given to the creativity of marketing campaigns that reveal the ridiculousness of certain intellectual property protection. Basically, ambush marketing today works like a circle. 
Exclusive rights are followed by creative marketing, which leads to stricter laws that in turn incite the creativity of marketing teams again. From a moral perspective, it is about finding a balance between protecting free speech and the interests of the Olympic movement and its partners. It all comes down to the question that we asked at the beginning. Who owns the Olympics? On paper, it might be the IOC. But the Olympic movement is sustained by a global public goodwill. The Olympics and sport itself can never be owned by anyone but its people. The athletes. We believe everyone should be able to tell their stories about sport. Whether it's a local butcher, a powerful sports brand or some random YouTube channel. If you want to help us create more videos to share our fascination for sports, you can support us on Patreon, like our newest MVP, Eli Eiske.